So the task I've set myself today is to try and convince you that thinking leads to an appetite for learning. And when I was looking online for pictures and I searched for appetite for learning, could there be a more wonderful picture than this child who is voraciously gobbling up a learning opportunity? So I, I, I just I was so thrilled when I found this picture for you. So we're going to be looking at thinking skills. We're going to be looking at how thinking skills can activate learning. And I'm just going to flick back, actually. But before we start looking at strategies and techniques, one of the things I want to address is whether thinking skills is more than just a lovely way for children to be thinking about learning. And we love it. We all love it when children are talking and discussing and getting engaged. We love it when young people in FE are talking about current affairs and sharing opinions and backing up their opinions with um, facts. You know, we, we love debate. We, you know, we, we, we all like seeing our learners discussing and engaging and predicting and analysing. We love that. But we also know that we are in a world that is somewhat dominated by assessments, by exams, by interviews, and by a curriculum that we need to teach. So the, the place that I wanted to start with is, can thinking skills help to deliver knowledge that we have to deliver to children and young people? Because that is the world that we are living in. So I'm gonna try a small experiment on you. And the experiment is going to start with me sharing a definition of thinking skills. And this definition is something that I wrote myself. I defined it because thinking skills was part of my PhD. So this is a really well thought out definition. Hours and hours have gone into this. And I'm going to share my definition with you in a moment because this is a crucial piece of knowledge that I, I want to convey to you. So bear with me and um, this is our starting point. Here's the definition. Thinking skills is the use of pedagogical, i.e. teaching, strategies and approaches such that cognitive dissonance may be activated in any curriculum area to stimulate interest, encourage discussion, increase motivation, and promote metacognition to enable significant learning. Now, I might be going out on a limb here, but did many of you enjoy or pick up much from just being told a definition? So this is a definition I'm really proud of, but it's a Thursday evening. What was the experience like for you of, of being told something, of being informed of something? And I'm perfectly happy if anybody wants to unmute and answer that question, or you can jot your thoughts in the chat. But you had a definition. Was that a nice way to be taught something? What was your response to being given a definition? And um, Angela, if you, if, if you feel like reading any of those comments, I'm just really interested if my hunch is correct. So, so a quick look in the chat. Sorry, um, a bit dry. It sort of washes over me. I found it a bit hard to understand, somewhat overwhelming. Boring. <laughs> I'm afraid I didn't completely grasp it. I'd have needed a few looks, listens of it to fully absorb. Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, firstly, I thank you for your honesty. So that's brilliant. Um, and, and this is exactly it. 
This is exactly it. Now, if I was teaching, I might have spent a bit more time explaining cognitive dissonance, and we will come to that. But cognitive dissonance is basically having a sense of puzzlement or curiosity. So something in the brain that causes you to want to find out more. So if I was teaching, I probably would have explained that. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the definition as it stands, when it's given to people cold, isn't always or even often a particularly good way of teaching. So let's try this. Instead, I am giving you two pictures. Now, if we were in a room together, I would absolutely put you in pairs because a really important part of thinking skills is to activate language. So I would put you in pairs and I would ask you to discuss what you're seeing. But I'd like you to have a look at these two pictures and think for a moment, which one of these looks most like thinking skills? Which one looks most like engaged learning? Which one do you think is more effective? And which class would you rather be in? So feel free to jot thoughts down in the chat or unmute and um, and, and um, tell me what you're thinking. But we'll just pause for a couple of moments and have a look at those two pictures and just jot down anything that really strikes you. Oh, lovely comment. First picture's no brainer. The one on the floor, they look so engaged. Children on the floor. The first one, active engaged in learning. Definitely the more creative class on the floor, the left hand side one. Brilliant. First picture every time. <laughs> Excellent. And um, somebody said that it looks more um, child led. OK, so if we look at those two pictures, you can see that the children on the left have been given some kind of activity that has engaged them. So there's something there that's got them that they're, they're all focused on the same task. They're trying to solve something. And when we think about thinking skills, we tend to be thinking about activating some kind of puzzle or problem or something to be discovered or discussed or negotiated. Otherwise, it's simply not engaging. And what I find really interesting in the picture on the right, the teacher is explaining maths and she's got seven plus two equals nine, three plus three. And one of the things that I found discovered really early on with maths is that when I was helping a child with maths difficulties, I tended to loom into their space. And as soon as you start explaining maths to a child, pretty much nothing goes in. All that I think the child experiences is the fact that you know the maths and you're talking maths, but you're not actually sharing the concept. And Vygotsky, um, who was the far, one of the fathers of thinking skills, spoke of the fact that it's almost impossible to give a concept to a learner. What you can do, what you need to do, is to create an environment where the concept becomes something that they absorb naturally. And one of Vygotsky's um, metaphors, if you like, was if you had a um, chimpanzee and there was a banana that was out of reach, if you left a stick nearby the chimpanzee so it could pick up the stick, it would form the concept of using the stick to get the banana. So there's a problem but then the um, context is shaped so that the animal can come up with a solution for herself. And we're uh, applying that same logic here to learning, which is that if you present something that inspires curiosity, that inspires motivation. 
And if you then create the environment whereby the tools exist, then children and young people will acquire the next steps for themselves through dialogue or through mediated support from the adult. And it's, I just think it's really, really interesting. And particularly when we think about the context now, there's a real push to get young people to catch up with the curriculum. And I worry terribly that that means we're going to get more of teachers feeling forced to tell children what it is they need to know when that just doesn't work as a learning activity. So thinking skills is something that I'm really passionate about. And I think it is absolutely the route to helping young people to engage in the curriculum, even if it's a curriculum that's in some way prescribed. So if we were in a room together, one of the things that I might ask you to do based on these pictures is to create your own definition of thinking skills. So if we were in a room together, I'd be dishing out some post-it notes and saying, what might your definition of thinking skills be? So maybe you'd be kind enough just to jot in the chat. Now that you've had a chance to look at the two pictures and picture one was a much better image of thinking skills and picture two was an example of um, chalk face teaching or teacher talk teaching. So could you just write for me, and I'll have a look at these at the end. Could you just jot down in the chat what your own definition of thinking skills is as a result of that little activity we've just engaged in? I can see a few coming in. Actually, I think I will have a look. Would um, you like me to read them out, Amelia? Um, yes, that would be lovely. I've just noticed that Rebecca um, has made a point about being a devil's advocate that um, it's not always right to get um, answers that may not be correct and that's absolutely right there is a time and a place where an explanation needs to be given um, what I think is interesting about that question and maybe we could discuss it more afterwards but I yeah let, let's discuss this more afterwards I mean you're absolutely right a teacher does need to say things at the front of the class sometimes but I do think it's heavily overused so but do do please come back to me on this so yes Angie do, could you read out some of the um Definition. Okay, so the first one, children answering open type questions where there isn't necessarily one correct answer. Lovely. Next one, a way of figuring things out. Yeah, making like combinations in your brain with your experiences, knowledge and observations. Nice. Feeling the desire or need to work something out. Curiosity. I like that. The next one, to allow learners to solve problems rather than being told how to solve things. Yep. Next one, problem solving, working things out for themselves. The next one, active engagement in the acquisition of knowledge, reasoning and experimentation. Brilliant. Learner-led, creative, contextualised learning, problem solving, assessing, Brilliant. gathering and exchanging information. Yep. Um, we've got a few more. Thinking skills involve children being engaged, challenged, collaborating and discussing the learning process. Using tools and resources as strategies to a problem solving endeavour. Um, problem solving, hearing other opinions, articulating their own thoughts, engaging with ideas and finding ways to problem solve and think things through. 
to organize and rationalize abstract concepts and thoughts in order to add to existing knowledge and skills. Oh, that's rather nice. Thinking about thinking about thinking, yeah. identifying and analyzing, not learning facts. Yep. Provide activities where you do share, discuss with another or others, process information, make connections and having access to an environment in which you can solve problems and become absorbed in in learning these are wonderful <laughs> these are absolutely wonderful and it's so interesting because the what thinking skills is is a factual thing and yet people have used an activity used a thinking skills activity to come up with something that wasn't well explained by giving people a formal definition so you've you've just proved my experiment rather beautifully and the the definitions are fantastic so you know i, I do love working with a knowledgeable audience thank you very much for that so what was the difference just a, a reflection really what was the emotional difference what was the experiential difference between being told the definition and building the definition up for yourself through an activity that got you to think around some of the core themes and introduce some of the vocabulary so and again, feel free to jot this in the chat, but how did it feel for you, the difference of, between being told it and building it up for yourself using scaffolding and support and the resources and the right kind of context to um, draw your thinking into a certain direction? So yes, do, do pop that in the chat, that'd be great. And Andrew, if you could read a few of those out. I'm just really interested in how people experience that as a difference. OK, so the first one that's come in, long term stickiness. Yes, um, so because you build it up for yourself, it remains in memory, um, goes into long term memory and becomes owned by the person because it came from them and therefore they can keep it. They have that ownership. Absolutely. Being involved in the process gave me permission to learn in a way that suits me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Empowering. Next one gave me a deeper understanding and confidence to incorporate such strategies into my own practice. Mm. The next one, how I got there was for me to decide. I like it. The next one, engagement. Deeper engagement with material and ideas, examining from various angles. Nice. nice. The next one, more of an understanding. Yeah. A deeper understanding and ability to explain myself. Yeah. Um, so one more. Yeah. Ownership, sorry, ownership is exactly what first came into my mind. I have figured this out myself. It's a source of pride. Fantastic. Um, wow. I imagine that the connections um, made in the brain are stronger. And one more, I felt a bit of anxiety with both ways. Mm. First, about remembering and understanding it all. And second, due to the possibility of not getting it right. Mm. However, the second was definitely more engaging and it was really helpful to hear everyone's ideas, yeah. which helped me to grasp the concepts better. Brilliant. I mean, a really um, brilliant responses. Thank you. And imagine that you also had that activity with a colleague. So you were able to add on the peer dialogue and the talking as well. So you achieved all of that without having the conversational side. So just incredible, really, really great responses. Thank you. So let's revisit this and see how it feels, whether it feels different. Thinking skills is the use of pedagogical strategies and approaches 
such that cognitive dissonance may be activated in any curriculum area to stimulate interest, encourage discussion, increase motivation and promote metacognition to enable significant learning. Now, was it better the second time round? Because the hunch is that because your brains have had a chance to really process the information, make sense of it, make sense of it for yourselves, own it, that when we come back to this definition, my hunch is that for most of you, you're going, oh, yeah, got it. Easy as pie. No problem here at all. And this, for me, is an example of why thinking skills activities isn't just about a soft touch teaching. It's actually about a powerful way to push learning in the most academic and rigorous style, because there's nothing, as one of your colleagues said, nothing more dense or boring than something like this. And yet thinking skills as an activity enables this to be accessible. And this is the demonstration. And I, I've, I, I think you've proved this beautifully for me. So thank you. So here's another thinking skills activity for you. Find the imposter. These are all different types of teaching approaches or strategies or schemes or schemes of work or programs or interventions. So problem based learning is a, a teaching approach that starts with a difficulty and um, children are expected to try and find solutions. Cognitive acceleration through science education is a specific um, um, commercial program. Jolly Phonics, I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's a phonics based literacy program. Enrich Maths is a um, a very rich math resource. I'm not going to give too much away, but it's well worth looking at. Philosophy for children encourages debate, curiosity. Open questioning is more of a, a style of asking questions. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And spring, again, well worth looking at this piece of research, is, is social pedagogy research in groups. So which one of these is generally not a thinking skills activity? Any ideas? Feel free to drop your thoughts in the chat. Angela, what, what are people flagging? Um, one, one person's put number two, uh, somebody else phonics, a, couple, a few people are putting phonics, yes. So, so Excellent. far, one person has said number two, yeah. cognitive acceleration, other people, the jolly phonics. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit of a trick question because jolly phonics um, is, is the answer I was thinking of. But you could perhaps, you could almost make anything thinking skills if you really wanted to. It's also a bit unfair to ask people to find an imposter when they're not familiar with all the things here. So, you know, I, I, I admit this is not a perfect activity. Um, cognitive acceleration through science education is actually about using thinking skills such as prediction in order to accelerate thinking. So it is actually a thinking skills program, but you, you wouldn't necessarily know that. So a little bit naughty with this activity, but it's just a nice way to give some examples of the types of things that can be thinking skills. And some of these I will talk about in a little bit more detail. It's always useful to understand the impact of anything that we do. So I just wanted to share this particular piece of research and this particular researcher measured a powerful effect size equivalent to 21 percentage points when a teacher used problem solving in a classroom and an effect size of around 37 percentile points when experimental inquiry is used. So we're just checking in here on the impact of thinking skills on achievement and attainment because that is a very real part of our lives as teachers. 
So whether you're in schools or FE, we, we need to be able to show that what we're doing is making some kind of difference to attainment. So it's good to know that there is that there have been some really good studies done on thinking skills. And I just thought this quote was rather, rather gorgeous from this study. When a teacher utilizes problem solving to enhance students' understanding of content, students are presented with a situation relative to specific information or a specific skill, and then presented with obstacles relevant to that information or skill. Such activities require students to think about content in unusual ways, thus deepening their understanding. And I really like that. I think it's a point that um, somebody made in the chat about looking at something in a different way. And sometimes you can think of it as shining a spotlight on something in a different way. And when I did my research a while ago in a, um, a middle school, one of the teachers using the thinking skills activities said that she had got an interesting answer from an unusual corner of the room. So there's something rather lovely here about open answers because a child that lacks confidence is encouraged to give a more um, to give an answer as long as there's a logic to the answer. They, it, it's much easier to answer an open question with a creative solution than to answer what we might call a, um, a hands up or an initiate response feedback answer. So I'll just give you an example, and this is relevant to um, an activity that's coming up. If I was a science teacher and I walked into a lesson and I said to you all sitting here, who can tell me what a mammal is? That is quite an intimidating question. You've got to be sure that you've got all the elements of a mammal. Um, we might have some ideas about what it means to be a mammal, but actually one doesn't want to put one's hand up and, and try that because it's gonna be, it's gonna not be good enough in some sense. You're gonna miss something out. So it's not very, very inviting. But we are going to come to an activity that would stimulate all that kind of thinking, but in a much more powerful way. So I'm just going to leave that there as a bit of a teaser. So how does a thinking skills approach support a learner with special educational needs? And one of the things that I really, really like about a thinking skills approach is that it is very supportive of anybody that wants to teach a mixed ability class. And I think this is particularly important right now because as young people come back into education post COVID, so some have been educated in schools and colleges, others have been educated at home. But as we start to open the doors and reintegrate young people into what is a more normal environment, some of the research has been quite, um, profound in saying that we shouldn't rush too quickly to um, put in interventions. We need to spend a bit of time bringing young people back into the community, getting them used to formal learning, um, building up confidence, allowing young people to connect with their friends, really focusing on well-being. And one of the ways that we should be doing that, and this is from a piece of research from the Institute from the National Literacy Centre, is we should be starting fundamentally with mixed ability classes, teaching people together as much as possible, rather than trying to predict who's going to need what intervention or who needs to be in what type of smaller group. And with a mixed ability teaching approach, if you start with a thinking skills activity, if you construct your lesson around active learning, and peer dialogue, then you can embrace everybody. And then the actual differentiation that you need, need to do can actually be much smaller. So you might get people into smaller groups, but somebody will need pre-teaching of vocabulary, or maybe key words with their pictures need to be available, or maybe a child with autism needs some sentence starters. So there's something quite powerful about a thinking skills approach being the bedrock of a lesson 
all about active learning, all about discovery, all about talking. And when we have this kind of lesson, what we what we tend to find is that the anxious child, the young adult with low motivation or the learner with literacy difficulties or the learner who has difficulties with social skills or attachment difficulties or speech, language and communication needs are embraced and included by this type of lesson. Whereas if you start your lesson with listening, reading, writing, or one person in the class gives an answer while everybody else has to listen to that answer and its response, you almost open the door to children and young people switching off, feeling anxious, becoming disengaged, if somebody has literacy difficulties and the first activity that they have to do is to do with reading or writing, they're going to be switched off. So there's something I think really powerful about designing an active lesson as your first port of call. And the first thing that a young person has to do when they come into your lesson is to think and talk rather than sit, listen, read or write. And the role of oracy, vocabulary and voice pretty much underpins how we think about thinking skills. And we've got a huge amount of research here. The role of vocabulary is incredibly important. And we know that poor vocabulary is not only more common in families with lower socioeconomic status, but it's a predictor of a continuation of that lower economic status. So it leads to, it's correlated with poorer school success, poorer adult outcomes, and also poorer mental health. So there's something hugely important about building vocabulary and encouraging voice and oracy. And it's just a really interesting one. When we look at disadvantage in the world, the world is a kinder place to people who are articulate. And if you think about booking a, an appointment or responding to a court hearing um, or arguing for greater provision for a child with special educational needs or putting your point across, being articulate gives you a significant advantage. So the more we can encourage our young people to be articulate, the bigger the gift we are giving them. So vocabulary acquisition is really imp important and learning how to use that vocabulary to express oneself is a really powerful tool. And this comes from a piece of research from the Burko report, which I'm sure most of you are really familiar with, but there's a link to it there, but it's just really important. And there's a, there's a wonderful colleague that I work with called Professor Julie Dockrell, who is so eminent, it's unbelievable. Um, and one of the pieces of work that she's done is on the communication supporting classroom observation tool. And I have given you the link, but if you Google it, the tool is free to download. And the tool itself is designed for key stage one and two, but the principles can be clearly extrapolated into key stage three, four, um, FE and HE. But the kind of things that underpin a great communication supporting classroom is the environment, language learning interactions and language learning opportunities. And the toolkit looks a bit like this. It, it's, it's a lovely toolkit, you download it, it's free, it's got a fully worked um, example of the grid with lots of um, examples of the kind of things that you might you might see. But the point of this is for you to do a learning walk or to give it to teachers in your context so they can assess their own provision. And you'll see from the top, it comes from the communication trust, but it's free to download. And it helps you to interrogate your provision. So are we providing language learning opportunities? For example, do we offer small group work facilitated by an adult? Do young people have opportunities to engage in interactive book reading? For example, predictive questions, joining in with repetition, story packs. This is for slightly younger years. 
do our young people have opportunities to engage in structured conversations with teachers and other adults? And this is a really interesting one because it, although this is um, predicated on key stage one and two, I worked for a while in Rains Park High School in a um, almost like a, it was a pre-exclusion hub. So it was supportive. We offered counselling and anger management, that kind of thing. And one young man I had weekly sessions with and he didn't want to talk through any of his difficulties. He was in year 11. What he did want to do was discuss the complexities of current affairs. So he loved coming in, picking up something in a newspaper, a current topic and debating it. And this just gave him an opportunity to give voice, express his opinions, formulate words, and that just really built up his confidence. So a lot of this can really be extrapolated for older learners. And the, the, the fifth one here, of course, is making sure that everybody is actively engaged in small group activities. It's a really very user friendly piece of work and I highly recommend it. Language learning opportunities. I've just written them there because it's a little bit more clear. Interactive book reading, group activities and crucially peer to peer talk. And this is an example of a resource that might support that. I love Robert Fisher's work. He's got a whole range. They start off with first stories for thinking and they move into really sophisticated um, ways of encouraging philosophical thought. And some examples from first stories for thinking. Could there be a real monster in Loch Ness? Can you imagine something that could never exist? Can people see things that are not really there? And one of the things that I've found very often when working with children with special educational needs is that the more boring questions, the recall questions, are often ones that they're not terribly good at. But they often blossom when the question is more interesting and more imaginative and more creative. So quite often you can stimulate somebody's thinking and engagement with the learning when you ask them something that's actually more difficult, but it's more exciting. And I think these questions are a really um, lovely way to proceed. So one of the things that we're thinking about here is that thinking skills operate really powerfully at universal provision. So we're thinking about high quality teaching and an inclusive whole school environment. And when young people are really engaged in their learning, they are likely, to, they are less likely to need targeted interventions or specialist support. And when you talk to um, practitioners or um, 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 people who support young, young people, they say that when the provision is provided appropriately within school or college, then only the right children get put forward for an intervention not the wrong children. So it's all about are we can we possibly meet needs in the most ordinary of settings before we put somebody forward for an intervention that actually they wouldn't need if they were taught in a way that really engaged them. And this is a really powerful one for me when thinking about mental health and well-being, because it seems to me that a lot of behavioural issues um, come about because somebody isn't engaging well in the classroom. Sorry, my cat's having a sneeze. So really, really important. So when we think about thinking skills and lessons, the kind of activities you might expect would be problem solving, higher order thinking, multi-sensory learning, anything that's playful and creative and spontaneous can engage a young person and mean that their behavior is less likely to go off the rails. So just going back to my earlier point, if you are a young person and you walk into a lesson and your um, excitement is captured and you walk out of the lesson feeling as if you've achieved something and are clever, you are far less likely to engage in behaviors that put you at risk of exclusions or detentions. Peer dialogue, Linking learning to pupil experiences and interests is absolutely critical. If it's not relevant, then why should they bother? 
you know, why, why should they give you their time and attention if we haven't made it relevant to them? ICT can be really powerful and rich stimulating starter activities, again, can make a massive difference. So this is one of my favorite starter activities and it's the odd one out. So you might be thinking, you might be saying to your, your, your class, which one of these is the odd one out and why? But crucially, you want to let them know that there are many more than one right answer. So the duck could be the odd one out because it's not a mammal. Or the duck could be the odd one out because the bat and the dolphin use sonar or echolocation. Or perhaps the bat is the odd one out because it's nocturnal and I was going to say it, um, it, it's the only one that flies, but of course a duck will fly. So the dolphin could be the, the odd one out because um, the bat and the duck will fly. So you've got lots and lots of examples. And what you're doing is you're teasing out the answers that most fit into your lesson activity. So you might start this off as a think pair share activity. So young people come into the lesson, they're used to using an odd one out activity, you put them in pairs, maybe you fed some core vocabulary to young people that need a bit of stimulus. And so what they're doing is they're thinking, they're engaging. Maybe you've asked one or two to look at a video for homework. So they've got some beautiful words like nocturnal and habitat and um, echolocation. But what's happening is that they have the time and space to use language, access vocabulary, access prior learning. So when the teacher then moves into the lesson topic, which could be habitats, or it could be what's a mammal, or it could be how do we propel ourselves through water or air. So you, you enable young people to get a head start on the lesson. You're pretty much plowing the field so they're ready for when the seeds of the lesson start to get sprinkled. And this can just make a massive difference to the motivation of a young person when you then give them a writing activity because they've had a chance to feel clever and competent. And thinking about thinking skills and thinking about easy, quick ways to plan lessons. Using diagrams, using thinking frameworks can be really, really helpful. So you can take a Venn diagram, you can think about whatever it is that you're teaching, give two examples of it and allow your learners to spend two or three minutes thinking about what's the same and what's different. Do that in pairs, have some key vocab up there and boom, when you move into your topic area, you've already activated your cognitive dissonance, encouraged language, encouraged peer talk and you're halfway there. So we're using these frameworks to activate cognitive dissonance which means that we're using an idea or an object or a picture to create curiosity through ambiguity. And I'm just going to show you a couple more. I love this one. It's the seven box diagram. And you put your topic or your picture or your paragraph in the middle and you invite your learners to identify what happened before or what caused something and what the consequences were. So it's hugely versatile, absolutely smack bang in the middle of your curriculum area, but it's still creative. It still creates ambiguity. It still is a, is a forum for conversation and dialogue, but you can use it in any subject area. The fortune line graph, sorry, my faces aren't, aren't, aren't particularly pretty. I'm sure you could do a better one. But what you've got here are faces going negative, medium, happy. Across the bottom, you'd have the narrative. So you might have um, a story sequence. You might write the sequence down so you can differentiate this bit. Some learners will write the story sequences down, write the key plot events. Others will need the plot events written for them. Others, you might write the plot events um, and have that then cut up. And what you're going to ask them to do is to sequence it across the bottom of the graph. 
before they do the activity. So it's the subtle differentiation. And then what you do is you ask the learner to plot how characters felt at different points in the story. So it's perfect for history or English or creative writing or literature. And you can encourage young people to think about how two protagonists or characters might have different emotions um, in response to the same event. So you get a lovely compare and contrast. You get great use of language. Like um, when this happened, um, Sophie felt elated, but Sonal was devastated. You get some lovely complex language. And you can also add emotion words into the graph. So you can extend vocabulary as well. So really simple idea, but really creative. And you can extend it in lots of different ways. I like this one because it's simple, smart art in words. So anybody that uses a Word document has access to all of these next um, frameworks. So this could be a really nice one for developing a creative story or exploring history or writing a travel brochure. So you might start off with a picture of sandstone rock formations, and then people use this diagram to allow ideas to spread based on a starting point. This is all about part whole relationships. So you might start with a, a family like horses and then split that up into different types of groups, domestic wild, thoroughbred, shire. It's always very interesting in maths because if you put something like a hundred at the top, how a young person splits them gives you a really good insight into how their numerosity is. So if they split it with 50-50, then you know that actually their numerosity isn't corresponding to the size differential. So it's just something to play around with. You can just get a really good glimpse as to how a, a young person is thinking about a topic area. Sequencing, this one's more basic, but the idea of having an event followed by another event that builds on an idea and then builds on the next idea can just be really supportive of children with sequencing difficulties um, perhaps with literacy difficulties like dyslexia as well. And again, life cycles, really obvious, but can be very containing for some learners. I like this one for context. So you could have the picture in the middle and then your learners have to think about what's the immediate context. Is the bear in a cave or on a tree? Is the cave or tree in a particular province of China? where is that province located? So it's a way of building up context. And this works really well around habitat or history or story writing. And the types of things that we might see around thinking skills are visual frameworks, moving knowledge from one form to another. So you've learned something, but can it be recreated as a poster? Or could the poster be on the one hand advertising this for one audience and then perhaps moving it into a children's story. So moving knowledge from one form to another or from one audience to another is a great way to make sure you've got that lovely, sticky, long-term, really embedded memory. And um, often questions that invite thinking might be prediction. This one came from a lesson around food webs. What do you think would happen if all the lettuces died? Quite creative, quite interesting, but still smack bang in the heart of your curriculum. Justification. What evidence would you look for to show that slugs eat lettuces? You know, really fits into your curriculum, but it's still quite inviting. And there are lots of interesting answers, all of which would be well applauded and valued by a teacher. Which basically just makes them a lot more inviting. So I'm going to leave you with a resource that I think is really wonderful. But this is all about using higher order thinking processes and activities in a lesson and thinking about them when you're planning your lesson. So you take your Bloom's Taxonomy verb wheel. And when you're thinking about your lesson objective, instead of learn something or understand something, your lesson objective could be confirm. So we're looking at the um, section in orange, confirm, relate, 
estimate, predict, construct, solve, analyze, sort, categorize, compose, generate, critique. And all of these lead us to an activity. And all of these are a type of higher order thinking skill. And what's really lovely about this wheel is not only have you got the particular type of thinking that you're encouraging in the purple center, you've got your verbs to steer you straight into an active lesson. And then you've got your lovely um, examples of what the output might be, a graph or a poster or a diagram or a forecast or a presentation or a group discussion. So this is just a really quick way to move into your design of active lessons. And really that's my thinking skills lecture in a nutshell, but I promised you that I would leave you with some resources. So I'm just about to do that. But to conclude, one of the things that I really love about what thinking skills offers to you as a teacher and your students or learners is it's intrinsically a very respectful and trusting process. So right at the beginning, I gave you a pair of pictures and I knew, I trusted that those pictures would enable you to form these incredible definitions which you, you gave me. So it's around trust, it's around respect, it's about allowing the learner time to engage, it's trusting that children will work together if it's the right activity, it's believing that children want to learn, it's trusting your own ability to respond to the unexpected and to enjoy that. And it allows fun and enjoyment into the curriculum. So it leads to some really important relational values between the learner and the teacher. And I, I, for me, this is, this is really powerful. So I'm about to unveil my library of resources for you. It's not quite as big as that, but we, um, we've just launched, so I more or less, I co-wrote this. It's a back on track guidance for schools and families. That's the link to it. And we've got some research there about how COVID-19 and the response to it has impacted on children and families, but it's chock full of really good links to really good resources. So do download that. It's completely free. We think it's really helpful. That's a podcast that um, I did to talk about the impact of COVID. 19 on young people. The communication supporting classroom observation tool can be downloaded from there. The spring project link is there. The Enrich Maths website is really full of resources. It's really helpful. Cognitive acceleration is there. Thinking through primary teaching is a wonderful book and it really um, opened my mind to thinking skills in general, but I really recommend it. Philosophy for children is there. More on visual strategies is there. For those of you in FE, my study bar has at least 50 apps that can support learning. So it's designed for um, learners with dyslexia or literacy difficulties, but it's immensely useful. So that's a great one for FE or Key Stage 3 and 4. Load to Learn is good for FE and also HE. But it, it was a collaboration between Dyslexia Action and, um, um, and, and um, RNIB, the Royal National Institute of the Blind. And it, it basically puts a number of texts into auditory books. So that's a really good charity. The Communication Trust has an incredible wealth of resources that start from babies and early years and goes right up to adult communication. But that is a really rich site. And Critical Thinking for Primary School Children was a resource recommended by um, somebody at a previous talk. And it's got some really good resources there as well. Um, that's our website. And we've got a whole section on resources that we collated for homeschooling. So lots and lots of links there. Um, support for managing anxiety, support for um, finding social stories to help children with autism manage the transition back into school, all sorts of stuff. So again, um, we're all about the treasure trove, we're all about the toolkit. <laughs>